Acts chapter 13. And as you're turning there, I just want to orient you to remember when you compare the book of Acts to the gospel of Luke, Luke said that he wrote uh, Luke and Acts to give confidence or to give certainty. Uh, The gospel of Luke was to give confidence or certainty about all that Jesus began to do, Jesus' life and his ministry, his teaching, his death, his resurrection. And so the book of Acts is a follow-up to that gospel. It's written to give us confidence of all that Jesus continues to do from his heavenly throne as the risen Lord, as the reigning king. So the book of Acts is really written to give us confidence that King Jesus is on his throne and he's establishing churches and therefore expanding his kingdom. Well, let's now hear from God's word in Acts chapter 13. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years, and after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And Though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And When they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news 
that what God promised to the fathers, this He has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that He raised Him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, He has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says in another psalm, you will not let your holy ones see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Friends, as God has spoken to us in His Word, let's respond to Him in prayer. Father, we ask that You would send Your Spirit now that we might see Your Son. That we might see Christ working from His heavenly throne. We ask that You would illuminate our minds and stir our affections and align our wills to all that You have revealed in Your Word. Give us confidence in Your Word. And give us confidence that your spirit is working and establishing churches even now. And Father, give us joy in being your fellow workers for the truth. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus said to his apostles in verse 8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Why? Why did Jesus promise this power of the Spirit to come upon the apostles, those who are already regenerate, those who were already in the household of God? It was to be His witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. This uh, programmatic text or this legend or key for the book of Acts promises that the rest of Acts is going to unfold just as Jesus says, that the gospel would be established first in Jerusalem, through the apostolic word that's being recorded in writing in the New Testament. This is what Ephesians tells us, that the church was founded on the apostles and prophets. But then that word established in Jerusalem, established in churches in Jerusalem, would now spread to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So let me just catch you up on what's happening before we get to Acts chapter 13. In Acts 1, there's this promise that the word would spread out of Jerusalem... And that's exactly what we see as the book of Acts unfolds, this geographic spread of the word. You keep seeing these summary statements in the book of Acts, like in chapter 12, the word of God increased and multiplied. It's almost as if Hebrews is true, that the word of God is living and active. The word of God is this living word that spreads and accomplishes the purposes of God. 
It is the word through the people of God that Jesus has chosen as the means to establish churches and to strengthen churches. So how does this unfold in Acts 1 through 12? Well, in Acts 1 through 6, the church is being established in Jerusalem. Jesus' authorized apostles are establishing and founding the church in Jerusalem. And then starting in Acts 6 all the way through Acts 8, the word starts to spread out of Jerusalem into Samaria. In Acts chapter 9, Jesus authorizes his last apostle, Saul, the apostle Paul. In Acts 9, this is a crucial chapter where the last apostle is authorized to launch the Gentile mission. We're now moving out of Jerusalem into Samaria, and we're heading towards the ends of the earth. And so in Acts chapter 10, all the way through the rest of the book of Acts, Jesus is sending servants to spread the word to the Gentiles. In Acts 11, let me just remind you that the believers in Jerusalem are persecuted, so many of them flee north to Antioch, which is where we're in here in Acts 11. So these persecuted believers are now in Antioch. And in Acts 12, King Herod kills the apostle James and imprisons Peter. In Acts 13, we note at the very beginning of the first few verses that there's all of these prophets and teachers in Antioch. Why? Why right after King Herod dies, uh, kills the Apostle James and imprisons Peter, why do we have this list of prophets and teachers in this young persecuted church in Antioch? Friends, Acts 13 is documenting a transition in the Great Commission, in the unfolding of the church's Great Commission. Whereas in Acts 12, since the Apostle James was killed, why is it that James is not replaced? I mean, when Judas died, he had to be replaced. That's how Acts opens up. We need another to fill, fulfill his spot. But why is it that as the apostles start to die or be killed, they're not uh, ordaining new apostles? They're not affirming new apostles? Matthias replaced Judas. We now have one new apostle, Paul, the last of the apostles. So why isn't James replaced? And why this list in Acts 13 of these prophets and teachers? And, and then why document here in Acts 13 the sending of missionaries? The apostolic age is closing. The missionary age is beginning. Now, Jesus promised in Matthew 16, I will build my church. And in Matthew 28, he said, I am with you always. And he gives this great commission to make disciples, to go, to baptize, to teach. You see, friends, Acts 13 is this transition out of the apostolic age into the missionary age. The age of sending missionaries to establish and strengthen churches. So let me summarize. Acts 1 through 12 shows us how King Jesus founded his church using apostles. But starting in Acts 13, we begin to see how Jesus expands his kingdom by establishing, by strengthening churches, and it's through missionaries. In other words, the Great Commission is now carried on in this age, the age you and I live in. The Great Commission is now carried on by elder-led churches that send spirit-empowered missionaries. And these missionaries spread God's word. This is Jesus' method. This is Jesus' model for establishing and strengthening churches. So if you want to walk away with one simple summary statement or or point of the sermon today, it's this. If you want to meditate over lunch together and talk more about application, this is what Acts 13 is about. Be confident the Spirit establishes churches. We can be confident the Spirit of God is establishing churches. And through this way, King Jesus, on His throne, is expanding His kingdom. So what I want to do is I want to unpack four essentials, four ways of how we gain confidence. Four essentials for, for planting and strengthening churches. Now this, these four essentials should have an effect on us. There should be an application for us. This effect is one that gives us confidence that Jesus really is on his heavenly throne. He really is reigning. He really is working. And he's doing this through the Spirit by establishing and strengthening churches. So first... First, we should be confident. The Spirit establishes churches by sending servants. 
We should be confident the Spirit establishes churches by sending servants. We should notice the kind of servants that the Spirit is first sending out as missionaries and and even those who are leading here in the church in Antioch. Look at the first four verses. In verse 2, it is the Spirit who directs the church to set apart these first missionaries. In verse 4, it is the Spirit who is identified as the agent who sends the missionaries. Whatever else the church does in affirming someone and training someone and sending someone and supporting someone, it is first and foremost the Spirit of God that identifies, that calls, that ultimately sends. So I want to observe five characteristics about these first missionaries. These first missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, that are sent out from this young persecuted church in Antioch. But first of all, these two servants, Barnabas and Paul, are seasoned servants. By this time, Barnabas had over 10 years of ministry experience. Again, the young church in Antioch of persecuted believers who left Jerusalem, and the church in Jerusalem sees this, and they want to send someone to encourage, to pastor, to teach, to shepherd this young congregation. They don't send a young buck. They send Barnabas, who's got a decade of ministry experience. Barnabas, the encourager. Barnabas, the exhorter. He's a gifted preacher. And Paul, by now, had between 12 and 15 years of ministry experience. Now, these were seasoned servants. And friends, there's an application here for us as well. We should be looking around in the church for God's grace at work in people's lives. People who are understanding the word and ministering the word to others, who are discipling others in the faith, encouraging them in the way that we see God's grace working in their lives. And pushing and provoking them to consider serving as an elder or a deacon or as a missionary, as a pastor. We look for seasoned servants to send and support. Well, second, these are spirit-filled servants. Look at verse 9. Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, confronts this magician. The same language is used of Barnabas back in chapter 11, that Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. You see, in Luke and Acts, this idea of the Spirit filling or empowering or coming upon someone, it is for a task. It's not for regeneration. Constantly we see believers filled with the Spirit or empowered by the Spirit or the Spirit coming upon them as Jesus told the apostles would happen in Acts 1. It's not for regeneration. It's for the task of the Great Commission. It's for the ministry of the Word of God. And this is what Jesus said in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you so that you will be my witnesses. You remember in Acts 4 when Peter and John were released, but they were told, don't speak anymore to anyone about this name Jesus. And what were the believers doing? They were praying the words of Psalm 2, asking God for boldness to speak God's word about Jesus, even when the authorities were telling them not to. And what happened in Acts 4? The believers were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. This filling, this empowering, this coming upon someone of the Spirit of God for the task of the Great Commission, for the ministry of the word of God. Friends, missionaries are not perfect Christians. You're not looking for perfect Christians. But you are looking just like a pastor for someone who is exemplary, someone whom the Spirit of God has come upon in order to minister the word of God. The new Christians on the mission field will not only follow in what they hear from the missionary, but what they see in the missionary's life, just as you do here with your own pastors. This is why Paul exhorted Timothy, a young missionary to Ephesus, in 1 Timothy 4, keep a close watch on yourself and on your doctrine. We are to look for spirit-filled, godly people to send as missionaries and church planters. Well, third, not only are these, new miss- these missionaries seasoned and spirit-filled, they also served together on teams. They didn't go out by themselves. The Spirit identified two to send together, and they took a third with them, young John Mark. In verse 1, it's this young church that's filled with several leaders, these prophets and teachers. I mean, as soon as Barnabas gets there, he sees the church growing. He's preaching the word. He goes and recruits Paul to come help him. He's already brought John Mark with him from Jerusalem. Now he's got Paul, and there's this whole team of people leading the church in Antioch. And the 
the Spirit tells the young church, set aside Paul and Barnabas. But notice verse 5. The Spirit didn't say anything about John Mark, and yet here Paul and Barnabas decide to take John Mark with them, some, some missionary assistant, a missionary apprentice, one in training. There's over 100 names connected with Paul in Acts and the epistles. And 38 out of 100, are, Paul calls his co-workers, his fellow workers, people who are laboring with him. Paul was regularly identifying and recruiting and training and serving with others. He didn't roll solo. And Paul identified men like Timothy and Titus. He invested in them and he sent them to strengthen churches in Ephesus and Crete. And there's an application again. It's the same application for for all of us, it is the whole church, every member of the church that's looking for others in, who are maturing in the faith, who are understanding the word and applying the word to their own life, to their family, to the ministry of the church. We all have this privilege and responsibility of identifying God's grace in each other and vocalizing it and telling others, I see the work of God in you in this way. I want to encourage you and affirm you. Keep doing that. Keep exercising hospitality, keep loving people the way that you love people. You're not taking the list of, uh, of gifts and the scriptures and aligning them all into some long list and then trying to find some specific uh, gift that you somehow align with. You're just identifying how the Spirit of God is working in people's lives, how they're loving the body, how they're obeying the commands of scripture, how they're practicing the 35 one another's of the, the New Testament. A fourth, these missionaries are scripture servants. Look at verse 9. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And what does Paul do? What, what is this power that Paul gets from the Holy Spirit? He just speaks in verse 10. He speaks words. He, he says, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Here's Elimus who's opposing the teaching and Paul takes phrases from Proverbs 10 and Hosea 14 and pronounces judgment against this magician. Paul's power, as is the power throughout all of Acts, the power of the Spirit coming upon him is the power to take the written word of God and apply it to a specific situation and speak God's word. Paul's Spirit-given power is the power to speak the word. All the miraculous signs and wonders that we see happen are simply authenticating him as an apostle. That Jesus has authorized him as one of his apostles to be his messenger. It's the power to speak the word. Well, fifth, the missionaries were sent abroad. These missionaries were sent. It's a very basic point. But I think it needs to be said. In verses 3 through 6 and in verses 13 and 14, we see multiple times it says they were sent off, that they sailed, that they traveled by land. Friends, the word mission and missionary entails geographic movement. It requires a sending to another, another tribe or language or people or nation. It's so popular today to talk about being missional or to say we're all missionaries. And I understand the heart behind it. The intent is to say we all need to be faithful in proclaiming the gospel. Great. It's just a mixing of words. We're all to be faithful evangelists, those who proclaim the gospel, but a missionary is one that's sent geographically. Now, Paul's uh, travel involved almost 9,000 tra uh, miles of traveling by foot. That's like walking across the U.S. almost three times. If you include all of his sailing and other means of travel, he is estimated to have traveled 15,000 miles. He was sent geographically. And I want to encourage you, if you're let's say, under 50 years old today. You could be over 50. But let's say, especially if you're under 50. Have you thought about training and serving as a missionary? Uh, I've been reading missionary biographies for years and years. People are sent into their 60s. Uh, there's no age too young to go. It might take you 5 or 10 or 20 years to prepare and go. So what? I first started having aspirations for serving the Lord as a missionary 30 years ago when I first came to Christ as a young teenager. And only now in my 40s does it seem the Lord is allowing that to happen. I started formal training and education 20 years ago. And God's providence didn't permit us to go. So what if it takes 10 or 15 or 20 years before the Lord might send you? Pray. Ask the Lord. Ask other people in this church, in your life, to 
affirm God's grace gifts in your life to see ways that you particularly could serve the church, but maybe the church where Christ, uh, maybe the tribes where Christ is not known or the church that's struggling in some place where you can go and encourage and pastor. This was a team of seasoned, spirit-filled scripture servants who were sent abroad together to help plant and strengthen churches These five characteristics of these first missionaries were all just summarizing this first point, that the Spirit establishes churches by sending, sending people. We can hear about all sorts of other kinds of work of uh, God, you know, giving people dreams and people coming to faith. It is first and foremost the method of God to send people. What a privilege. What a joy that he would send people. Well, second, we should be confident the Spirit establishes churches from churches, from churches. The Spirit establishes churches first by sending people, but those people are sent from churches. Those people have seen a healthy model of a local church. They know what to replicate. They know how to make disciples because they have first been discipled in a local church. So yes, it is the Spirit who's first identified as sending the missionaries, but then it is also the church. Notice verse 2 again. Here's the church in Antioch. They're worshiping the Lord and fasting. And then in verse 3, they, the church, sent them off. In Acts 14, it also says that Antioch commended them for the work. It is the local church that's obeying the Spirit, identifying the people, and then sending and commending and affirming them. It's a simple point. The church is the one who sends and supports missionaries. I mean, this was already happening when we landed in Acts 13 because these believers fled from Jerusalem to Antioch, and so Jerusalem sends Barnabas down to help shepherd and pastor the church. And then Barnabas recruits Paul. Friends, in the New Testament, it is churches that send missionaries to send, to establish, to strengthen churches. And we all get to participate in this. Whether you're one, the one who goes as the missionary or whether you're one who stays back as the sender. Remember Romans 10. How will they hear if there's not a preacher? And how will that person go if we're not sending? We're all participants. I hope not to ever write a missionary support letter that says, thank you for allowing me to do the work. I couldn't be here without you. No. We are fellow participants. I'm there going and I'm there working and you're here working and praying and sending. Whoever you guys partner with as missionaries, you're both fellow workers, the sender and the goer, equal participants in the progress of the gospel. Fellow workers for the truth is what John says. We all participate in this. And even in identifying, uh, of course, your elders might have particular responsibility to identify God's grace at work in people's lives and maybe missionaries from other churches that you want to support and partner with. But every single member of this local church has that responsibility of identifying God's grace in the lives of other people. And bringing those names to the elders. Have you thought about so-and-so? Have you seen so-and-so? And encouraging them even to their face. Well, so first, we should be confident the Spirit is establishing churches by sending servants, and this sending of servants happens through churches. But third, third, we should be confident the Spirit establishes churches through the written word spoken. The written word spoken. This is the means by which the Spirit of God establishes churches. The written word is spoken. And first, I want to just briefly summarize the content of Paul's sermon. Starting in verse 16 all the way through 47, I want to just summarize in five points the content of the sermon, but then I want to direct our attention to the form of the sermon, the form. So just briefly, what is the content of Paul's sermon? Uh, Many have noticed this summary. It's not unique to myself. Uh, It's very similar to Peter's sermon earlier in Acts. It's very similar to 1 Corinthians 15 as a summary of the gospel. It's a five-point gospel outline that Paul's walking through. First, God sent him. Second, they killed him. Third, God raised him. Fourth, witnesses saw him. And fifth, we proclaim him. And then some call, like repent and believe. Again, God sent him. They killed him. God raised him. Witnesses saw him. We proclaim him. 
And there's more or less explanation depending on where you are in the book of Acts and who the audience is. Are they in a synagogue? Are they speaking to Gentiles? God sent him, that is, the promised Savior King. A proofs from Scripture of who this King would be, of who this Savior would be, the Christ. They killed him, or in Peter's context in Acts 2, Peter speaks directly to them and says, you killed him. But God raised him and witnesses saw him, and so we proclaim him. And friends, this is the gospel that we believe. This is what, what we believe and trust in order to bring us into the family of God. In order to unite us to Christ. This is the gospel that we proclaim to unbelievers. Friend, if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, this is what you have to believe to become a believer. To, to, to be given the forgiveness of sins and to be in right standing with God. That there is a gracious, kind, loving creator who designed us for his own purposes. And yet we've rejected him. We've rebelled against him. We could just summarize all the laws of the Old Testament to love God, to love one another. And we've not even done that. And yet God in his kindness sent his own son, fully God, fully man, who lived a perfect life, obeyed all of God's law, died as a substitute for sinners, was raised again, triumphant, defeating sin and death. And he's on his heavenly throne. And his second coming will not be as his first. A young man on the plane I was flying with on, on uh, Friday asked me, do you think Jesus is coming back? And what's that about? I got to share the gospel that Jesus' second coming is one of judgment. He's already come to establish forgiveness and right standing with God. He's coming again as our judge. We must be hidden in him. We must trust in his life and death and resurrection. We must turn from our rebellion to have forgiveness, to have union, to have adoption. This is the gospel we proclaim. This is the gospel that we believe. This is what brings us into the family of God. And this message that Paul summarizes, quoting portions of Scripture and summarizing whole narratives of Scripture. And so with this broad outline, this this. Five points that I've just summarized. I want to instead focus our time on this point and the medium of the message. The written word spoken. The written word of Scripture needs to be spoken in evangelism and discipleship. For the establishing and the strengthening of healthy churches, they need the word of God. This emphasis on the written word is throughout Paul's sermon. Let's just walk very briefly through it. Look at verses 14 and 15. Uh, Paul and Barney go into the synagogue. They listen. And what do they listen to? The written word read out loud. The law and the prophets. In verse 16, Paul exhorts them and says, listen. And what is he going to do? He's going to teach. He's going to orally proclaim. But he's going to summarize the written word and quote the written word. In verse 26, Paul says, this message of salvation has been sent. How was it sent? In writing, not in video, not in drama, not in pictures, in writing. Not even oral means. They didn't just memorize orally and pass that down. They were commanded to write down what they heard. All the way through to Revelation where John is commanded to write down what he saw. In verse 27... He says that the utterances or the spoken words of the prophets are read aloud every Sabbath. In verse 29, Paul preaches the events of Jesus fulfilling. What did he fulfill? He fulfilled written revelation. In verse 32, Paul says, we bring you the good news that God promised. Where did he promise that? Not orally for people to memorize and forget. He promised and recorded it and passed it down from generation to generation in writing. In verse 33, he says, He has fulfilled what is written. Look at verse 33. And then he quotes Psalm 2. In verse 34, he says, He has spoken. And Paul quotes Isaiah 55. In verse 35, he quotes Psalm 16. In verses 40 and 41, Paul warns his listeners about what is being said in the prophets. That is, what is written in the prophets and then proclaimed now to you 
In verse 41, Paul quotes from Habakkuk 1. In verse 42, the people wanted more teaching the next Sabbath. That is, they wanted to hear more of the written word proclaimed and explained to them. And in verse 44, almost the whole city is said to gather. Why? To hear the word taught. In verse 46, he says, we are turning to the Gentiles. What are they going to do? They're going to preach the written word just like they just did. In verse 47, this is interesting. Paul quotes Isaiah 49, and he applies it to himself as an ambassador, as an apostle. Paul takes Isaiah 49 as his justification for going to the Gentiles. Verse 48, he says the Gentiles rejoice. And did you notice when I was reading verse 48, what did the Gentiles rejoice? They rejoiced and glorified the word. Besides direct quotes, Paul summarizes whole portions of written scripture. Friends, what if God's money and God's people and God's time were spent on God's strategy? The written word that's sent abroad, that's translated for every tribe and language and people and nation, and as it's translated, it's being proclaimed. It's being spoken in evangelism. It's being preached and taught and memorized in scripture in the gatherings. It's being sung in the gatherings, the whole book of Psalms. It's being prayed in the gatherings. It's being read aloud in the gatherings. What if God's method was used in missions? Sending servants with the written word which translate and speak or sign. Now churches need the word in their gatherings. Matthew 28, this great commission command to go make disciples of all nations, to baptize, to teach all, to observe all that he has commanded. So why is it today with 7,000, almost 400 languages, we have less than 10% of the world's languages with scripture? 720 as of last month. Only 720 languages out of 7,000, almost 400 have God's word translated in the language they understand. That's less than 10%. We've seen three essentials for establishing churches. The Spirit uses churches to send servants who speak the written word. Well, fourth, and this point is very brief. We should be confident the Spirit establishes churches by saving sinners. The Spirit establishes churches by saving sinners. And we see this point very briefly in verses 48 to 52. Verse 48, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So here's the missionaries in verse 49, spreading the word and trusting the spirit to do his work. In verse 52, it is God who grants saving faith. And the missionaries do their part. They're proclaiming the word, preaching the word, teaching the word. They've memorized the word, but it is God, the spirit who grants faith. And this is the missionary task to obey God's instruction for local churches to identify and send these servants and, and pray and strengthen them and encourage them so that those who go may preach, may pray, may disciple and trust God. We've thought about these four essentials and these four essentials of establishing churches of the Spirit sending servants, of churches sending servants, of these servants speaking the written word, of God saving sinners. I want to end with a final application here. Paul says in Romans 15, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. And then he quotes Isaiah 52. In Romans 15, Paul says he has this ambition to preach the gospel, and his justification is Isaiah 52, so that those who have never heard will understand. So I want to ask you, what is your ambition for Christ? I don't mean for being a faithful Christian in, in the realm in which God has given you your roles. Of course, we're all under the lordship of Christ, which rules every domain of our lives, we're to be faithful disciples. Yes, faithful husbands, faithful fathers, faithful spouses, faithful children, space, faithful co-workers, faithful church members. Yes, yes, all of that falls under the domain of just being a faithful disciple, a faithful Christian, a faithful child of God, a faithful witness. Yes, yes, but... Beyond that, Paul says, I have this ambition to preach the gospel where Christ is not known, where 
There's no foundation. What is your ambition for Christ, for the spread of the gospel, for the Great Commission? Maybe it's not you who goes, but you can do more to be a faithful sender. I mean, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6 that there's great gain in godliness with contentment, and it's not like he just leaves it up to us to figure out what we should be content with. No, he says, if we're content with food and shelter, you see, the simpler that we live, the, the lives of simplicity that, that we live allows our hearts, our affections, our time, our money to be dedicated to the Great Commission, whether as one who goes or as one who stays to send. This is what Paul confronted the church in Corinth about in 2 Corinthians 6. He said, you are restricted in your affections. And he asked the Corinthians, widen your hearts. Your hearts are so small. They're so restricted. You have these worldly affections. And these worldly affections are gripping your heart. And he's confronting them. Widen your heart. Have the right affections for God, for his people, for the gospel, for his glory, for the great commission. He's not commissioning all of them to become missionaries. But they're not even a church that he'll he'll even accept support from. We all have a part to play, as Paul says in Romans 10. Some go and some, some the rest send. Friends, our confidence is that King Jesus is on his throne. He is expanding his kingdom. He does it by establishing and strengthening churches, by sending his word abroad. And we all have this joy of participating this privilege of participating in it, whether it's those who go or those who send. Well, I want to close with this story of Ann Robertson. This comes uh, from a book called Her Story. I commend it to you greatly. It's a devotional. It's a 365-day devotional where every single page is about just godly women of faith in the history of the church, faithful mothers and uh, faithful daughters, faithful missionaries, faithful martyrs. It's just a, it's a devotional of godly women throughout history. And this is about Ann Robertson from the 1800s. From her father, Ann had the conviction that the Native Americans needed to have the Bible in their native language. In Georgia, her father Samuel had begun translating the Bible into Cherokee and writing a Cherokee grammar. When her father's translation work and the grammar, along with the printing press, were lost when the boat carrying their possessions sank in the Arkansas River, Anne knew what this loss of his translation work meant to her father. The press was eventually recovered, and they established the first printing press in Oklahoma. When Anne was 15, she was sent to an academy in Vermont for her education. She became proficient in Greek and Latin. In 1846, Anne returned to help her parents teach at, the, at, at Park Hill. And in 1850, she married William Robertson. They moved to the Tullahassee Mission near present-day Muskogee, Oklahoma. The couple had four children at the Tullahassee Mission, and Anne learned the Muskogee language spoken by the Creek and Seminole Native Americans. And she helped in all aspects of the mission. With her husband, she oversaw the boarding school with 100 students. Listen to this last part. Anne was often ill. She was sick. But she used those periods of forced inactivity to study the Creek language. And with her husband, she translated a number of school books and hymnals, Christian tracts into Muskogee. But her real delight was translating the Bible from Greek into the Creek language. The first edition of the New Testament in Muskogee was printed in 1887, and she continued biblical translation work throughout her life, translating the Psalms, the historical books, revising the New Testament, She had almost completed her fifth revision of the New Testament when she died in 1905. Her labors provided the words of life to the Creeks and Seminoles. Friends, God's word gives us confidence. Confidence that King Jesus is on his throne. He is establishing his church. His spirit sends servants from churches who speak the written word and trust God to save sinners. Let's pray. Father, you are the God of peace, and we know that you raised our Lord Jesus from the dead. He is a strong shepherd, and we admit we are his weak sheep. So we ask that you would send your spirit to equip us with everything good to do your will. 
We ask that you would work in us what is pleasing in your sight through Jesus, our Savior King. And it is for his glory and the good of your people in every tribe and language that we ask this. In Christ's name, amen.